Welcome everybody. As the co-chair of the Slack Colloquium series, I'm very happy to introduce a man who doesn't need any introduction at Slack, Michael Peskin. Um, Michael received his PhD in uh, 1978 from Cornell University working on the Nobel laureate Kenneth Wilson. Um, he then went on as a postdoc to prestigious places such as Harvard, um, Saclay, and Cornell again, and then became a member of the Slack faculty in 1982. Um, he is, of course, a very well-regarded scientist. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Scientists since uh, 2000, and um, he frequently appears in uh, uh, public news outlets. The other day when I was driving to Slack, I heard him on uh, KQED forum, which was quite entertaining. Um, the, uh, he's also very well known for a book he has written, and many graduate students and, and undergraduate students have used this book. Uh, it's uh, called An Introduction to Quantum Field Theory, so if you're interested in that topic, I encourage you to read that. Um, it's um, not the easiest read, but, but still, uh, if you're interested, you should look at it. Um, Michael even has a physical uh, parameter named after him, the so-called Peskin Takeuchi parameter, is that right? Um, that uh, he uh, came up with in, uh, I think, 1990, and I looked it up by now. This, this, the paper describing this has more than a thousand citations, so it's, a, it's a very, in, in very high regards uh, with his physics colleagues. Um, of course, the reason why we're here today um, is the Higgs boson, and um, Michael is clearly absolutely an expert on the Higgs boson. Um, the first paper he wrote about this topic was also in 1990, and ever since he has been waiting for the discovery of this particle. Um, before I close, I want to I um, give you a quote that he made. Uh, it appeared on July 19, 2012, when he said that uh, in fact, at that time, in fact, we are no closer to finding the God particle than the cavemen were. <laughs> well, that's what I found. I'm sorry. I can sh okay. <laughs> Maybe he never said that. But I think he's going to convince you today that we are indeed closer than the cavemen were. And with that, I turn it over to Michael. He never said that. <laughs> Okay. okay, well, good afternoon. It is really an honor to be asked to give the first of these Science of Slack series lectures. And I hope at least I'll keep you entertained. Uh, maybe you'll even learn something, who knows. Um, so everybody has heard about this thing, the Higgs particle. It, it really couldn't have escaped your attention. It's been seen in many media this uh, was the picture that was on the front page of the New York Times on July 4th, 2012, uh, talking about the seminar announcing the discovery of this particle. It's uh, led in a very short period of time to the Nobel Prize for these two men, uh, Francois Anglair and Peter Higgs, who developed uh, some of the original theoretical concept for this particle. Omitted here, unfortunately, is Robert Brout, uh, Anglaire's longtime collaborator, who passed away about a year before the Higgs discovery. Uh, Higgs made this statement when he was interviewed. I hope this recognition of fundamental science will help raise awareness of the value of blue sky research. So um, it's an interesting thing. It's way out there. It involves another object that's received a lot of attention in the press, the Large Hadron Collider at the laboratory CERN in Geneva, Switzerland, our sister laboratory in Switzerland, the host of the uh, largest particle accelerator in the world, uh, one of the most expensive also pieces of scientific equipment ever built. And the experiments at this collider involve a huge number of people. Here is a picture taken at the Nobel Prize announcement in the foyer of CERN uh, showing a few of the 6,000 physicists who are credited with the discovery of this particle. Well, 
This is a big subject. There's a lot of credit to go around. In this talk, I'm going to have some special mention of people here at Slack who've contributed to this story. And you'll see their pictures pop up from time to time. I, I don't mean to offend any of the other people in this picture, but uh, this is a lecture for you folks at Slack, so you should know what your friends are doing that's related to this strange particle. So now we've all recognized the name the Higgs particle. So what is the Higgs particle? Well, um, this is what I want to talk to you about today. What is the Higgs particle? Why was it so important to discover? What comes next? And also, what role does Slack have in the Higgs story? So what is the Higgs particle? You all know that back in the 80s, Leon Letterman, the former director of Fermilab, gave this the name the God particle. So that gave this particle a lot of recognition. Of course, not very clear about what actually is behind that. Very often, you'll see this particle uh, described as the origin of all mass in the universe. It's somewhat of an overstatement, but we'll try to make that a little more precise as we go along. Um, what I'd like to do first is to answer a question that this statement over here always brings up in people. Why do you need a particle to give mass to other particles in the universe? You all have a closet that looks like this. It's full of stuff. And stuff has mass, right? Well, it turns out that when you really look at things deeply, stuff does not necessarily have mass. In fact, there are barriers to giving mass to stuff that come from principles that are very well established by our work here. In particular, the, the principles of the special theory of relativity and quantum mechanics. And so I'd like to begin this lecture just by telling you a little about that. Why is it that if you believe in relativity and you believe in quantum mechanics, you're led to believe that it's not necessarily true that stuff has mass? In fact, in relativistic quantum theory, mass, a massive particle is not a separate entity. It's a collection of pieces that have to fit together in the right way in order to build a massive particle. So let's just start with a little of that story. It begins with this, the picture of an electromagnetic wave. Electromagnetism, it's a waves of electric and magnetic fields. As light goes through space, the electric and magnetic fields live in this configuration with the electric and magnetic fields exactly perpendicular and being exactly perpendicular to the direction of motion. And now, if you think about this hard, you'll realize that for this configuration to make sense, this object must be moving, not at any ordinary speed, but actually at the speed of light, at a speed that is that you can never attain by running faster and faster in some direction. This idea really was thought about hard for the first time by Einstein. And you probably have a picture of Einstein in your head, but it's not that Einstein who thought about this. It's, oh, I'm sorry, it's this Einstein. Um, the young Einstein who thought about putting a mirror in front of his face, running as hard as he could, and trying to make sense of what this configuration would look like from that point of view. You have to remember that Maxwell's equations was the superstring theory of its day. And this young fellow was very involved in what did that mean? What did that imply for physics? Let's talk a little more about electromagnetic waves. So here again is this picture. Um, the direction of the electric field is called the polarization direction of the wave. I, I put a slide in here that I skipped over. You all know that if you take pictures with polarizing filters, you see different things. In particular, a filter that cuts out the electric field parallel to the ground removes a lot of the glare of sun. And so an electromagnetic wave has basically two different components, one with the electric field this way, one with the electric field that way. For our discussion, it'll be useful to combine them into something that looks like this, which is a very beautiful picture of how an electromagnetic wave moves through space. The wave can be thought to wind around like this, moving forward, the electric and magnetic fields always remaining in a perpendicular orientation. 
Let's draw a picture of this like this. We can think of this as a right-handed spinning electromagnetic wave as it goes through space. Equally well, there can be a left-handed spinning wave. If you like the wave where the E field is straight is a combination of these, as are other polarization states. Now, this is very concrete. You can think of these E and B fields. Electric fields move charge. Magnetic fields move charge in some way. You can think of these things propagating through space. But now what Einstein encouraged us to do was to abstract from this. What are the basic elements of fundamental particles that we can write down in a theory? And that gives a notion like this. In quantum mechanics, um, almost all particles spin. In the same way that you think of the electromagnetic wave, the electric field rotates around the axis as it moves at the speed of light. An ideal quantum particle is an object with some intrinsic spin in it, always moving at the speed of light. So these are those ideal building blocks out of which we want to build material. Um, quantum mechanics tells us that that spin is quantized. And the quantization also comes with a certain number of states. So particles of what I'll call spin a half have two states. The, in the idealized form, always moving at the speed of light, a state with left-handed spin type polarization, a state with right-handed spin type polarization. Spin one particles have three states. Spin three halves, four states, et cetera, et cetera. In the ideal case, always moving at the speed of light. But these are the things that we can easily write down equations for. And now to make a model of the real world, we need to build out of these particles that um, can be massive. Now, how do you do that? It turns out that it's impossible to do that with a single one of these or a single one of these. You have to put these things together in combination. And there might, in fact, be obstructions in the theory that keep you from doing that. So let's talk a little about that. First of all, why is it that I can't just take this object moving at the speed of light, slow it down, and make a massive particle? What do I mean by a massive particle? I mean something with weight, something that I can hold here at rest with respect to me. So what happens when you try to do that? Well, here's what happens. You start with this, ah, in this case, right-handed spinning electron, let's say, a spin a half particle. I run very fast so I can see that at rest with respect to me, and I find that it looks like this. But now, once it's at rest, if it's not moving at the speed of light, I could even imagine running faster. Well, maybe I couldn't imagine running faster, but some of you in the audience might be able to run faster than me. And if you did that, you would see it looking like this. And please notice, this is now, this thing started out as a right-handed particle. This thing is a left-handed particle. So if you take these basic elements that move at the speed of light and you want to make a massive particle, something that you can hold in your hands, it has to be somehow a combination of these two idealized states, the one that spins to the left and the one that spins to the right. In a similar way, to make any particle massive, we take these idealized point things moving at the speed of light that Einstein gave us, and we need to combine them in a certain way. And that may or may not be possible. For an electron, it seems easy. The left-handed electron has an electric charge of minus one. The right-handed electron, that's the one over here, has a, an electric charge of minus one. No problem putting those together in a single state. Well, unfortunately, we know too much about physics to really accept that as the correct law. Because we know that in addition to electromagnetism, there are other laws of physics which might make their own restrictions, have their own charges. And those charges, if they're conserved, might prohibit these states from mixing together. In fact, we know about two other subnuclear laws of physics. One uh, mediated by a particle called the gluon is, called, is the strong interactions. That's the one that leads to uh, protons and neutrons binding in the nuclei, eventually 
the things called quarks inside protons and neutrons to bind together. And the other called the weak interaction, which is responsible for radioactive decay. The quanta that mediate the weak interactions are called W plus, W minus, and Z. The Z is a very interesting object here because in the 90s we spent a lot of effort really studying the Z and measuring its properties to very high precision. And these act on things that particle physicists call leptons, so the electron, the muon, and there's a heavy one, tau, that was discovered by Marty Pearl, who's sitting here in the front row, and their counterparts, the neutrinos, and quarks, the up and down quarks are the ones inside protons and neutrons. A different number of them is the difference between a proton and a neutron. But there are heavy ones running up to the top quark, which weighs about 170 times the mass of a proton. Now, the gluon also has a, a law of interaction that doesn't say much about whether things can have mass or not. But the weak interaction particles have a very different law of interaction, which is going to cause us some problems. And mainly I'm going to concentrate on the Z, but let me tell you first something about charge changing weak interactions. So this is some data collected by Kolk and Van Klinken in the 1970s, a long history of measurements of the polarization of electrons in beta decay, radioactive decay. It turns out that those electrons dominantly spin in the left-handed sense. And what this curve shows is that the faster it goes, the more perfectly that electron is spinning with a purely left-handed motion. So the further that electron approaches this idealized particle that moves at the speed of light, the more only the left ones come out, the right-handed ones don't come out of beta decay. It's weird. And it got weirder when people really studied this in great detail. Um, we were actually one of the laboratories that participated in this in the 1990s with a device here called the Slack Linear Collider. The whole accelerator was turned into an accelerator for electrons. The electrons eventually came out at energies up to 50 GeV, 50 times the proton mass at the end. Electrons went around a loop here. Positrons went around a loop here. That large building next to the LCLS experimental hall uh, housed a very beautiful detector called the SLD. Um, the energies of the electrons and positrons were adjusted so that when they annihilated, you were exactly at the energy equal to E equals mc squared, where m is the mass of this z particle. And so you could produce hundreds of thousands of z particles at rest and very carefully look at their properties. Here is the uh, uh, picture of the SLD detector, the, one of the principal architects, Marty Breidenbach, whom you've seen around the lab. Um, particle detectors are um, designed in such a way that there are layers. Each layer images a certain aspect of the particle collision. Um, in this case, you have here a gas chamber, so a charged particle will rip through that and make ionization that you can image. Then a lead liquid argon uh, barrel where um, Basically, particles with electromagnetic properties can make showers of electrons and positrons that can be gathered to measure the total energy of these particles. Then layers of iron to measure pions, kaons, etc. Anything that gets through the whole thing would be a muon. Um, the design of this detector, the basic design, was actually set down by Bert Richter in the 1960s. It worked. People have been following it ever since with gradual improvements, as you'll see in the course of this talk. Um, here's a picture of a Z decay to an electron and a positron. The straight track is a very high energy particle. This histogram shows a large electromagnetic deposition, a very energetic electromagnetic object with electric charge. That's an electron or a positron. Here's a picture of the Z decaying to the heavy lepton tau discovered by Marty Pearl in a signature where on one side you make a, uh, a pion or probably a rho meson, uh, the charged pion and the neutral pion represented by that electromagnetism. On the other side, a heavier particle called the A1. This kind of an asymmetric low multiplicity decay is characteristic of this heavy lepton tau. 
Um, here's a picture where the z decays to quarks. The quarks are seen in another way. They're not free particles. They only live inside protons, neutrons, pions, etc. Two quarks that you set in rapid motion rip through space. They give off gluons. The gluons give off more quarks and antiquarks. Eventually what you get is a shower of pions and kaons and things like that, which then this detector images. Such a shower we refer to as a jet. And you'll see more of these jets when I show you more recent pictures from particle physics. So a jet is an initial quark. Ah, actually, here's an event with three jets, one, two, three. The third one, very likely, is a gluon that was emitted by the quark and the antiquark when they were produced. OK. Now, what can this device tell us about the charge associated with the Z? The Z is a particle. Its equations are more or less just that of the photon. If the Z were massless, it would have a long-range force, just like the photon. It would have a, an electric charge, it, what I'll call it Z charge, that would be a conserved quantity. It would prohibit things from um, combining together in the way that we need to make mass. And oddly, the Z charge of the left-handed electron and the right-handed electron are different. Uh, here at Slack, we showed that in a very direct way. Maybe I should show this first. Um, this is the, uh, the rate of producing products of the Z as a function of the energy of the collider. An experiment done by one of our competitors, Opal, at the uh, competing facility at CERN, the Large Electron-Positron Collider. Um, those of you who know about atomic physics will see this as a resonance curve. And actually, the business of calculating the resonance line shape is very interesting. You only need one parameter. It's given by the position of the resonance, the, which is the mc squared, the mass of the z particle. And then everything else falls into place. And the fact that you get the right width and, in more detail, the right shape is a very detailed test of our understanding of the properties of the z and, in general, the properties of weak interactions. But here we did a very interesting experiment to show that the left and right-handed components of the electron have different z charge. Um, it's very interesting. This is a, an, a, one of the guns at the front end of the accelerator. Um, this thing here is maybe the key to the device. It's a little thing called a pockel cell that if you put a voltage on it, it causes circular polarization to come out in a photon. And if you put the opposite voltage on, the opposite circular polarization. So as you twiddle the voltage on this cell, photons come out in those left and right configurations. They strike a cathode here. They then, that then ejects an electron spinning to the left or the right. Now the electrons go down this line. They go into the accelerator. They travel four and a half kilometers over to the SLD detector. And there you notice that when you put a positive voltage on this thing, there's a 15% higher interaction rate than when you put a negative voltage on it. Um, the sign that there's a different interaction for these two pieces of the electron. There's lots of other data from the SLD that also indicates this. Let me just say that these two pictures would be exactly identical. This one induced by the left-handed spinning electron, this one the right-handed spinning electron, if the Z charges were the same for all the species of quarks and leptons. And obviously, they're totally different. So what does that give us? Well, now we have a problem. The Z charges are different for the left-handed and right-handed electron. So if those charges were exact, you couldn't combine these two halves to form a massive particle. And at the same time, we'd have another problem. The Z boson would be massless. It would lead to long-range forces. Instead of, as it is, weighing 90 times the mass of the proton, and contributing to forces that are of actually subnuclear extent. Something's wrong, and some kind of fix is needed for this kind of paradox. Well, historically, that fix came from thinking about another exotic object, one much better known, I think, to condensed matter physicists, a superconductor. 
A superconductor is a piece of material, let's say lead or tin, cooled down almost to absolute zero. Um, it then acquires a state where electric current flows frictionlessly. We now understand very well how that occurs. It turns out that, well, due to some physics that I don't have time to explain here, pairs of electrons pair up and condense and form an enormous freely moving soup inside the metal. Whenever you put a charge somewhere, that soup zooms in and neutralizes it. Whenever you try and set up an electromagnetic wave, this soup gets involved in the wave, and so it becomes sluggish. It's slowed down. It actually, at the quantum level, this wave becomes a massive particle. And so what people thought about was, well, couldn't we have the same thing going on everywhere in space? Some soup of stuff, it's neutral to the ordinary charge, but it affects the Z charge. It annihilates the Z charge and slows down the Z quantum oscillations. So in other words, in the midst of this soup of stuff, like a superconductor for Z charge, you can make this transition. And so you can combine and fit together the left and right-handed parts of the electron, the muon, the bottom quark, everything we need to make massive. And at the same time, um, it provides a state that looks like this, which is one of the three that you need to combine to make the Z particle itself massive. Well, that idea is called the Higgs mechanism. And it's a very beautiful idea. And now we'd like to find out if it's true. OK, let's review. The Higgs field, then, is the field responsible for creating the special state in which Z charge is no longer conserved. Stuff, if you try and put Z charge someplace, some stuff moves in and gloms it out, and it's no longer effective in prohibiting transitions that would be required to make things massive. Um, in, then, um, how do we get a handle on this state? Well, if it's a field that exists everywhere in space, we can put a little energy into it, make it wiggle. If we quantize those wiggles, we get particles. And so then we have something called the Higgs particle, which is the elementary quantum of the Higgs field. Now that Higgs particle is making transitions like this that are responsible for mass. And so in the simplest model, the Higgs particle should couple to each quark, lepton, and weak boson proportional to the mass of that particle. Can we test this idea? Well, to test that idea, you have to have a Higgs boson. You have to hold it in your hand. And just as we did for the Z, you have to somehow watch it decay and see if it decays to every particle in the right way with the strength, the coupling strength, um, characterized by this idea. And so now, how do you do that? Well, eventually, you have to first produce this particle and then study its properties. Um, what I put on this slide, what causes the Higgs superconductor to form? We haven't a clue. How can we find out? We have to grab this particle and try and measure its properties in detail, see if this kind of picture will hold up. OK, well, that now brings us back to the Large Hadron Collider. The Large Hadron Collider is an enormous ring accelerator, 27 kilometers around, underground in the vicinity of Geneva, Switzerland. Um, this is a little plan of the tunnel. Um, I'm going to talk about the ATLAS and CMS detectors, which are two enormous detectors that are built underground. Um, protons circulate in this ring. And this accelerator makes available proton-proton collisions so far at a center of mass energy of 8,000 GeV, 8,000 times the mass of the proton. Uh, next year, uh, somewhere between 13 and 14,000. So we're going to go up in energy and in brightness in the future of this machine. But to talk about what's been done so far, I, I would like to talk about some of the results from these two detectors, ATLAS and CMS. Um, some of your Slack colleagues are playing a big role in the ATLAS experiment. And CMS is, uh, well, brand X, what can I say? Here's a diagram of the ATLAS detector. Um, 
please notice that it has the same plan as SLD and other detectors of its era, except that actually it's a lot larger. The people in the figure have gotten a lot smaller. This thing is actually 10 stories high. In the center, there's a gas tracking chamber, actually now mainly silicon tracking chamber. Then your lead liquid argon calorimeter to measure electromagnetic deposition, then iron. This thing around the outside is new. It's something that makes a so-called toroidal magnetic field, the magnetic field that wraps around so that when muons, very high energy muons, penetrate all that iron and stuff and get to the outside, there's a magnetic field that can analyze their momentum. Um, this thing here is a cryostat for a superconducting magnet. I love to show this picture. That's a picture of that thing being delivered at CERN. So this is that tiny piece of the Atlas detector. Here's a picture from Atlas. Actually, no, this is a picture from CMS, the competition. And you see very clearly this two-jet structure that I pointed out. So this is a quark scattering off another quark. A quark coming out of one proton, coming together with a quark from the other proton, scattering in some way, each of them making a jet, a shower of pions and kaons. Here's a very impressive picture from Atlas. Two jets, one here and one here, a total energy of four TeV. That, at the time this picture was taken, was more than half of the total energy of the two protons that collided, coming out in two single quarks that recoil off each other with enormous strength. Um, you put protons together, quarks collide, more or less anything can come out that's, pro that's predicted by the laws of physics. Let me just show you a picture with a Z in it. So this is a very beautiful picture with two jets, one here and one here, both rather low intensity. And then on the other side, this very penetrating thing is a muon and another muon. So this is the reverse of the picture that I showed you before. I showed you a picture where electrons and positrons come together and they make the Z as a resonance. And the big peak is at that mass, the energy equal the, to the mc squared of the z. We can invert that for reactions like this. We measure the energy and momentum of each of the muons, and we combine those numbers, and we try and see if there's a resonance peak in that quantity. It's just e equals mc squared, except that you have to take into account that this system is moving. So you have to subtract something because it has net momentum. The exact formula is given here. Don't worry about that. I really, I know how to do this. And when you plot things up correctly, indeed, you find a beautiful resonance curve at the mass of 91 GeV, which I showed you before is associated with the Z boson. Now we want to look for Higgs bosons. And we'll try and use the same technique. We take, find some particles, measure their energy and momentum, use this formula to combine them, put them together, and look for a resonance at some particular value of the mass, and that would be a new particle, the Higgs boson. So let's see how that works. Well, now the question is, what, particles, what particle is it that you want to look for? What do you want to pick out and combine together? I told you before that the Higgs boson is expected to decay to the heaviest kind of particles, the heaviest quarks, leptons, or gauge bosons. So presumably you want to start from the top. You want to start literally from the top quark. Find pairs of top quarks, measure their energy and momentum, combine them in this way. Is there a peak? No. Well, maybe you want to go down the list. What about W or Z bosons? Here's an event with two Z bosons. Here, an electron a track and an electromagnetic deposition similarly over here. So this is an electron-positron pair. If you measured the total mass of this object, it would be around 91 GeV, the mass of the Z. Over here on the other side, there are two jets. And it turns out those also sum to the mass of the Z. So this is the kind of thing we're looking for. But if I measure the total mass of the entire system, they're just in a continuum. There's no bump. And so again, 
uh, you don't find the Higgs boson in this particular kind of reaction. Now we'll go down the list of mass. Maybe the Higgs is not heavy enough to be able to decay to two Zs. Two Zs weigh 180 GeV. Maybe the Higgs is lighter. In that case, its dominant decay would be to uh, the so-called bottom quark and its anti-quark. Um, we could try to look for jets that contain bottom quarks. Unfortunately, here there's a problem. If you just collide protons, you have gluons hitting gluons, and those make bottom quarks. And the rate for them to make bottom quarks at a mass at which you would want to find the Higgs boson is about a million times the rate for making a Higgs boson and having it decay to bottom quarks. So this is just incredibly difficult. We could look for tau leptons. That's also not so easy, although we'll say a little more about that later. Eventually, what people had to do was to keep going down the list to rather exotic decays of the Higgs boson, which were nevertheless extremely characteristic. So here are the two processes. They're characterized by a number called BR. That's the branching ratio. The branching ratio is the probability that if I have a Higgs boson, it decays to that final state. Please notice that these branching ratios are in the tenths percent. So these are extremely rare decays of the Higgs boson. Nevertheless, they're quite characteristic. One thing that can happen is that the Higgs boson can decay to a pair of Ws or a pair of top quarks by a quantum fluctuation. And then before those top quarks, let's say, have a chance to fluctuate back, they annihilate and make a pair of photons. That gives you a Higgs decay to two photons. And photons are very characteristic objects, easy to measure, easy to combine, and they contain the total visible mass of the Higgs. So we can make a resonance plot and see if we see a bump. Another thing you can do is to let the Higgs decay into two Zs. But again, the Higgs doesn't have enough mass in this hypothesis to be able to decay fully to two Zs. One of them appears, again, as a quantum fluctuation and evaporates into a pair of leptons, E plus E minus or mu plus mu minus. These are both extremely rare decay modes, but at least they're very characteristic. They can be picked out of the debris of proton-proton collisions, and we can try and see whether there are resonance bumps when we compute the mass of the final state objects. There's a problem. These channels represent 1 in 2 times 10 to the 12 proton collisions. So don't blink. You might miss it. Okay. Now, before I show you the data, I just wanted to show you a couple slides from Fabiola Giannotti's presentation of the discovery of the Z. Uh, at the beginning, she talked about um, the big challenge in 2012 pileup. Obviously, if these are very rare events, you want as many protons on protons as possible. And one of the ways to do that is to crank up the intensity of protons in the collision. Protons come in bunches, and in each bunch, you might have one proton-proton collision or more. The more you crank up the intensity, the more individual proton-proton collisions there are every time the bunches of protons go through each other. And in fact, the typical collision looked something like this, with 25 events of which one was interesting, and the rest were just garbage that you had to get rid of in order to study the interesting event. So you need some technology to do that. And a team of people in Atlas worked very hard on that problem. One of the heroes of it was uh, Ariel Schwartzman, an assistant professor in the Atlas group. So this is the um, spurious missing uh, unbalanced momentum before Ariel. This is the unbalanced momentum as a function of the number of collisions after Ariel. So then you can get to work and look for these events. OK, now here are some pictures. Uh, here's an Atlas candidate, Higgs to gamma gamma. Um, you see no track, so it's a neutral particle, and a big electromagnetic deposition, and one on the other side. That's two gamma rays going back to back. And then you can add up those momenta and look for a resonance peak. Here's another uh, similar event from CMS. A photon here, a photon here. Again, measure the energies and momentum. Use my formula. See if you see a peak. 
Um, here's a beautiful atlas candidate in um, four leptons. Two muons going through, highly penetrating. Two electrons, tracks, and electromagnetic deposition. Um, the sum of those uh, momenta, when you put it all together with that formula, is very close to 125 GeV. And here's uh, an event with four muons, again, very close to that mass value observed by CMS. When you put it all together and you look at the mass spectrum of two photons, there's a small but nevertheless noticeable bump on top of what's predicted by theory to be a very smooth background. There it is, the Higgs boson at 125 GeV. And if you look at the four leptons in the same place, there's, uh, well, not so many events, but a statistically very powerful peak representing the Higgs decay to four leptons. So now we've got it. Now there's a new particle, one not expected, except by the logic that I gave you before. Uh, coupling to at least to four leptons and to uh, pairs of photons and together at this common mass of 125 GeV, that's, as we know it, the Higgs boson. Um, an interesting question now is, does the new boson couple to all massive particles? And this is now uh, really the research frontier. Can we find not only these very rare decays, but all the more common decays, can we measure their relative rates to test whether this particle really does have the property to be the origin of mass for all quarks and leptons? Um, we saw the Higgs decay to ZZ. The Higgs decay to WW has been observed. The Higgs decay to Taus has been observed. I'll show you an example in a moment. The Higgs decay to B and its antiparticle B bar that's still um, a matter of question, and I'll show you that too. In the simplest model, the ratio of these rates should be proportional to the ratio, the square of the ratio of the tau to the B mass. Um, so this is predicted to be about 6% of all Higgs decays, this about more than half of all Higgs decays. What's the status? For tau, here's a very beautiful picture. This is actually the mode in which Marty originally discovered the tau. This is an electron that you see here. Here there's a muon. So it's a tau plus tau minus pair, one decaying to an electron in neutrinos, one to a muon in neutrinos. These taus were presumably made by quarks going, brushing by each other like that, each one emitting a W boson, and the W bosons combining to a Higgs. And actually these jets that you see here are those two quarks that scattered to produce the W bosons that produce the Higgs. Um, this lady, Sarah Demers, is one of the early postdoctoral graduates of our Atlas group. Now she's an assistant professor at Yale and one of the big experts on TAUs in Atlas. Here's the situation with uh, the Higgs decay to B. And I'm sorry, this is a complicated slide, but let me just point out the relevant thing. Uh, remember I told you there were many different ways to make B quark and anti-B quark pairs at a hadron collider. Even when you select for things that are very likely to be Higgs bosons, uh, most of these things come from other sources, from uh, Z decay, from W decay, from top quarks. That little red thing is the theoretical expectation for what should be the contribution of the Higgs boson to this data distribution. When you subtract the background, this point's high, there's a little excess. Here's the analogous plot from Atlas. Again, contribution of top quarks, W bosons, uh, Z bosons. Uh, this little red region here is what's expected from the Higgs. This point fluctuates low, maybe it isn't there. We'll find out. This is really going to be a question for the next run of the LHC, a very important question. Does the Higgs decay to bottom quarks enough to explain the mass of the bottom quark? Uh, naturally, there's somebody from Slack who's on this problem. The big difficulty here is looking for Bs that come from Z decay, from gluons, or from Higgs bosons, and trying to figure out how to tell these three processes apart. So to the naked eye, they look almost identical. If you're a very good analyst, you can look at subtle properties of these three production mechanisms that pull them apart 
And that's the project of Jacinto Picadillo, uh, the Panofsky Fellow who's working with the Atlas Group. Here's the current status according to CMS. Actually, there's a little too much model-dependent information for my taste. But you can see that in some channels, we understand that the, Z, that the Higgs rates accord with the predictions to about 30% accuracy, maybe uh, much less accuracy for the bottom quark. Um, eventually, this has to get much better. And so now we can talk about how to make it better. Well, what I'd really like to do is to produce the Higgs not in proton-proton collisions, where they're surrounded by debris, not only all these extra interactions, but all the other ways of producing the Higgs final state. But look at it in this reaction. Take an electron and a positron, bring them together, let them interact through the Z field, and it produces a final state with a Z going one way and a Higgs going the other way. Well, in the first half of this talk, I persuaded you that we know basically everything there is to know about the Z boson. So if you catch a Z boson moving at a certain speed in the laboratory, whatever's on the other side was this 125 GeV Higgs. And you just look at what's there, and you try and understand every decay mode of the Higgs in detail, just as we did in the 1990s with the Z itself. Here's a typical event. Um, so here is a Z captured in its decay to two electrons. And over here, the Higgs decaying to two bottom quarks. Actually, all the little glitches in this slide represent aspects of the bottom quark dynamics, which you can use to identify these events. Back in 1993, Dave Burke and Tim Barklow made the first exploratory measurements of this technique before people really knew how to build a collider that would actually make these events possible. Um, they argued that this was a very important program. Um, they got the mass wrong, but what can I say? Um, now we know what the mass is, and uh, we're really in a good position to say exactly what kind of accelerator we would like to do these experiments. Something else that happened in the 90s, um, stimulated to great extent by this kind of uh, theoretical and experimental investigation, was the design of a technology that would make it possible to do these experiments. There were many candidates. Actually, we worked very hard on a, uh, what turned out to be a losing candidate, X-band RF. The winner was this technology, championed by Bjorn Wieck. Uh, Wieck was actually a postdoc here around 1970, went back to DAISY, eventually became the head of the laboratory, and had the vision for this thing here, the niobium nine-cell superconducting cavity. It's something that could, with high efficiency, accelerate electrons and positrons. And so it could be a technology for high luminosity linear electron-positron colliders. And part of his vision said it could also be a technology for high rep rate X-ray free electron lasers. And he envisioned building at DAISY a unified facility that would have both of these ingredients. Well, that unified facility probably will not happen. But this technology, after 20 years, is now quite mature. And it's being used for all kinds of applications, both in particle physics and in x-ray science. In fact, one of the things you're going to hear in this series is that Mark Ross is going to tell you we're going to bring about half a kilometer of these things here to Slack to build the next generation LCLS. So this technology is very interesting. But now what can you do with it in particle physics? Well, you can build a giant electron-positron collider. The footprint here is 31 kilometers. It's about 10 kilometers in each side of accelerating structure. There are many slack people who've worked on this, uh, many of you in the audience, uh, three people who've really dedicated most of their lives for the past decade to um, designing this machine or shown here. It's called the International Linear Collider. It's actually got some momentum now for construction in Japan. Um, it'll be built in this very beautiful place, the Kitakami Mountain Range, north of Sendai in the north of the Honshu Island. And uh, here's a picture of the director of the project, Lynn Evans, talking to the Prime Minister of Japan, just to show you that there is some reality with the construction of this uh, enormous accelerator. Unfortunately, Abe didn't give him the money yet, but what can I do? Okay, and here's another of these beautiful pictures that we uh, expect to get and to use to analyze in detail what the interactions of this Higgs would be. 
does this particle couple to each individual species of quark and lepton just the right amount to make those transitions that we need to put the pieces together to make mass in a relativistic theory. If everything works as in the simplest model, here are the error bars that we expect to get. And maybe I should say, it doesn't have to happen that way. Models of the Higgs supercon superconductor predict deviations from that law, um, sometimes as small as the percent level, but we'll be sensitive to, to them. Will those deviations occur or not? Well, it's just a matter of doing the experiments and finding out, and we really hope to get there. So, that brings us to the end of the talk. Here are the conclusions. The Higgs particle has been discovered. The Higgs field exists. We found its particle avatar. It's still a very mysterious object. We don't know why it exists. We don't know how it works. We're still trying to find that out. The search to understand the Higgs field requires the highest technologies in particle physics experiments and in accelerators. We've seen that in the LHC and in the plans for accelerators of the next generation. This is a global endeavor. People, as I say, 3,000 physicists in each of two collaborations from all over the world working together to discover the Higgs boson, more in the future to understand its properties. And SLAC people have key roles in this global program. And engagement with the Higgs is integral to the development of accelerator science. And this will benefit SLAC in our activities abroad, working in these global collaborations, and as I've said already in the things that we do here, trying to develop applications of accelerators to other areas of science. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> okay, I have one sort of practical, like experimental question. When you're kind of scanning the collision, when you, when you change the collision energies in these big machines, <coughs> is this done in sort of sequence or does that introduce too much systematic error uh, or potential systematic error in the measurement? Is there a fancier way that this is done? Oh, um, well, it depends which technique you're using. And, and so let me just go back and show you a couple slides. So um, when I showed you this slide, where is it? When I showed you this slide from the LHC, we're looking at these things coming out. So the machine is at a single energy. It's producing Z particles in a very broad range of energies. And what we try to do is to use those relativistic formula to correct for how the z's are moving, to put them all on the same scale to make uh, the picture I showed you here. Now, the earlier picture that I showed you, ah, sorry, this one, um, that was actually done by scanning the energy of the machine. So this is now electrons and positrons colliding to make the z particle. And as you vary the energy of the accelerator, you go through a resonance, the rate of these processes increases. So yes, you have to very carefully step the accelerator, turn up the energy just a little. You have to have dedicated calibration to make sure that nothing has changed in the machine running conditions as this occurs. Um, it turns out that for E plus E minus, just ordinary electron positron scattering is a very good way to monitor, which has no reson which has a resonance, but um, it also has a forward direction that doesn't have the resonance. It's a very nice way to monitor that the machine performance is as identical as you can possibly make it as you scan through this resonance. And those scans were done here at LEP. They, they were also done here in the early days of the SLC. For the next generation, um, well, if we know the mass of the Higgs, we'll just go to where the cross-section is, is at its maximum. And uh, we'll just sit there for a long time. But if we discover another resonance like the Z at the electron-positron collider, we'll have to do the same uh, painful steps. You slowly vary the energy, you look for the resonance, and then you try and measure it as best you can and interpret it. Okay. Other questions?
Please. Cheryl. Um, for, uh, Cheryl. Oops. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Michael. I noticed you avoided using the word boson. Uh, you kept calling it the Higgs particle, and then towards the end you called it the Higgs superconductor. Oh. Uh, so could you kind of explain to us again why you called it a superconductor? Oh, um, well, the, remember there are these two distinct notions of the Higgs field and the Higgs particle. So the Higgs field is something that fill space. It's, it's something that permeates all of space and it moves around in response to Z charge. Okay, So that's very much like a superconductor where you have this electron pair fluid that fills a metal and if you put a charge into it, it gloms onto that charge and neutralizes it. So that's what I meant by the Higgs superconductor. I think the big conceptual problem for a theorist is why is there a Higgs superconductor? Why does empty space have this special structure which is totally non-obvious? And you know, for someone like me, that, that's the biggest question. Uh, we don't know the answer to it. There are lots of hypotheses. Uh, right now, we don't have good evidence that supports any one of them. Now, when you have a field, if you put some energy into it and wiggle it and make one quantum excitation of it, that's a particle. And so particles come in two kinds in relativistic theory. They're called bosons and fermions. But the distinction is not relevant for this talk, so I blurred over it. But the Higgs is a boson. A quark or an electron is a fermion. So please excuse me if I haven't made that clear. OK. So by having found this Higgs, has it told us anything about supersymmetry? Ah, well, supersymmetry has embedded in it one of these mechanisms for explaining why the Higgs superconductor exists. So, there, so the Higgs is a particle of a supersymmetric model. And within this, a model with this extra symmetry called supersymmetry, you can actually make a model of the dynamics of the Higgs particle. And it has the property that the potential is even minimum away from the state where there's no field at all. So it explains why there's field in space instead of no field. It's not the only way to explain that. Um, there are many other mechanisms. In fact, there are other large classes of mechanisms. All these mechanisms require new particles. And so what we're, one of the things that we're trying to do at the LHC is to find the characteristic particles that would tell us, is it supersymmetry? Is it um, Randall-Sundrum theory? Or is it um, the so-called little Higgs theory? Or some other one of these theories that have been proposed? Um, I could write a book on that. In fact, I practically <laughs> have written a book on that. Um, the problem is that none of these stupid particles have shown up. And so we're very confused about this. But it's really a choice. Do you, is there an explanation or is there not? If there's an explanation, we've got quantum theory. There are particles. They're out there. We have to go to higher energy. We have to be more patient. We'll find them. And so uh, fortunately, next year, the LHC will turn on again at almost twice as high an energy. It'll run and gather a data sample eventually 200 times what we have now. Um, people will work very hard to look in that sample to find some evidence for one of these theories. Right now, we don't know which one is the right one. Um, you showed very nicely that the Higgs particle has been discovered. What's the experimental evidence for this Higgs field, the superconducting field you speak of? Uh, well, well, if you like, the Higgs particle has properties that are predicted from this theory of the Higgs field. And so you can predict from that theory the rate at which you see protons going into resonant two-photon systems, resonant four-lepton systems, resonant tau plus tau minus systems. And the data is in rough agreement with those predictions. 
So by rough agreement, I mean at the, you know, the 30% level. So, well, you know, I've got to say that the evidence that this Higgs field exists is not exactly ironclad. You could probably come up with another theory or you could come up with an ad hoc theory. Um, as we get more data, maybe we'll narrow down on this one or another one. Uh, but I think what was predicted in advance, so far the experiments meet that expectation. So makes me happy. Okay, we have time for maybe one more question. Please, someone up there. Uh oh. So, so um, it looks like electrons collision. The da data is clean, cleaner than hadrons. I mean, you have a single thing versus a mass of stuff. So, also, what's the next step in terms and its energy scale? How how much more do you have to get before something interesting? Or maybe anything, everything's interesting. <laughs> okay, well, so, so there's this, this historical dichotomy between electron and proton colliders. The electron colliders are much cleaner. It's very easy to, much easier to interpret what individual events look like. On the other hand, we have a better technology for accelerating protons. So we can get the protons to much higher energy. And even if you consider that a proton is not an elementary particle, it's just a bag of quarks and gluons, even the quarks and gluons are at higher energy. So what can you do? Well, one thing is you can take advantage of the fact that we have this proton machine to look for new particles at the highest energies available. And so we're now looking for particles in the range of, of order one to two TeV, one to 2,000 times the mass of the proton. That's um, rather beyond what even this International Linear Collider will get to with electrons. On the other hand, um, it is perfectly possible that in this debris of the proton-proton collision, there are things you could miss. And one of my favorite dark matter candidates, the Higgsino, is something that's almost impossible to discover in the proton-proton environment. Maybe we'll find that at the ILC. Beyond that, people are thinking about accelerators of the next generation. Um, there's a proposal called CLIC at CERN that would be E plus E minus collisions at 3 TeV. Um, people are thinking now at CERN and also in China about 100 kilometer tunnels for proton-proton collisions that would bring you up another factor of, uh, let's say, well, from uh, 14 TeV to 100 TeV. Um, in proton-proton collisions. And of course, people here are developing technologies like the plasma wake field to eventually get us to five or 10 TeV in electron-electron collisions. So it's all out there in the future. These accelerators take a long time. I mean, you don't have to build this one while you're still the director. <laughs> but uh, we, we, we really would like to, to keep going on the road that will lead us to these very high energy machines. Okay, thank you very much.